Hello and welcome to the front page end of year special. I'm your host, Racing Post editor Tom Kerr. Over the last 50 shows or so this year, we have poured over all the big stories that have defined the racing year. And today for our end of year special, we thought rather than simply look back on those big, big stories, we would instead look forward and assess what the biggest stories of 2023 tell us about what is going to happen in the world of racing in 2024. To discuss this and to tell us a little bit about their reflections on the year and their highlights, I'm joined in the studio by front page regulars, Maddie Pleo and Lee Mottishead, and remotely from Ireland by David Jennings. Welcome all. How was your Christmas, Maddie? It was great. Yeah, I spent it um, with my sister. First time not at mum and dad's house, so different, um, but very enjoyable. Yeah, but back to the racing, lots of reporting to do elsewhere as well, Tom. So not too much rest for the wicked. No. And Lee, yourself, you're very Christmassy, of course, famously. Famously. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm quite bar humbuggy, really, but I'm very partial to the Christmas buns made by a growing high street bakery. So I uh, had quite a lot of those, love a bit of Stollen. Mm. Um, Are you a panettone man? No. You strike me as a so, panettone no, that's man, a no? really interesting subject. So, so <laughs> for a while, I did have a dalliance with Italian Christmas bakery treats. And then I realised I much prefer what the Germans produce. Okay. So now I'm all over Stollen in favour of panettone. Good Lord. Uh, DJ, how was your Christmas? The way Lee talks about food, it's where he was the size of me, like. But uh, he talks so... Uh, so eloquently about all these foods and it's actually I didn't think I could possibly be hungry again after all I ate on Christmas Day but I'm actually a bit peckish now after listening to Lee. Once the girdle comes off DJ it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> uh, well it's prettier than my sight let me tell you. <laughs> okay right well let us uh, jump straight into the first story that we're going to talk about and where else could we begin but the story that has in many ways defined 2023 for racing and for many of racing's customers it is i am sorry to say it is affordability uh, and the myriad implications of uh, the checks introduced by bookmakers over the last few years and codified by the uh, by the government in its gambling white paper which was released earlier this year um lee i think it's fair to say that not only has this dominated discussion over the last year, but it's also dominated the thinking of a lot of people in racing because it's having a very profound impact on the sport's finances and future prospects. It's certainly dominated the thinking of Racing Post readers in a way that I can't recall a subject having done in the past. The, the mailbag, the, well, the virtual mailbag of, of letters we've had on this subject exceeds anything um, that I've known um, before. So it really has exercise people because it has impacted on people's lives um, and where we are now is not a great place but the problem is where we could be in the future could be even worse mm. um, and I'm not really sure anybody can say with confidence how they think 2024 will go on that front not least because we are in a potentially turbulent political environment it's entirely possible Sunak could go to the polls in May, if not certainly later on in the year. We don't really know how that will impact on the white paper and affordability check, although they don't, as a, as a measure, have to go through as, uh, as legislation. Um, so we don't know where, that, where that's going to end up. Um, we don't know what the Gambling Commission will do in relation to the consultation. Um, they have been clear that the majority of responses in relation to consultation were about affordability checks. And I think we can assume were negative. About Absolutely, well. yeah. So they, they know what people think, yeah. but we also know that they have taken a, inverted commas, position mm. on this up to now. And whether they'll be willing to move on that position, we don't know. What I, what I would say is that if this all, in effect, um, fails to come to anything because there is an election before anything is resolved or decided, that places more power in the hands of the Gambling Commission and I don't think that would be a great outcome for racing either. No. So let's, let's dig into a few of these events that are going to happen over the coming months. Um, first of all, we have the petition which reached 100,000 uh, signatures quite recently. 
Um, the Petitions Committee have sort of kicked the can down the road yep. and whether there'll be a debate on that one, but we, we certainly expect and hope there will be a debate. I think it would be something of a democratic uh, outrage if yeah. there wasn't. Mm. Do we expect there to be any real consequences of that, of that petition debate or is that just an opportunity for Racing's allies and its customers to have their views heard? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's more of the latter, to be honest, Tom. I don't necessarily think it will um, yield anything, but I think the more that racing in particular um, with bookmakers can make their case for this in a, in a public manner, the more it exposes um, the, the ridiculous nature of the current proposals mm. and potentially serves to drive a bit of a wedge between DCMS and the Gambling Commission. Because I sense that's already happened to an extent through 2023. And I think if the government can be made to feel increasingly uncomfortable about what this might do to horse racing, mm. then maybe they might revisit um, the proposals. Although, of course, the proposals at the minute are based on um, outcomes that we don't think can be achieved, such as frictionless checks. And that then leads us to two things. First of all, the Gambling Commission's consultation response, which we expect to follow quite early in the new year, albeit there's no guarantee exactly when it will drop, but also what the government and the Gambling Commission propose doing in the interim. And this is this idea that the yeah. affordability checks outlined in the white paper will take time to implement in full for the reasons you've just said. And that in the meantime, the affordability checks being carried out by bookmakers probably need some uh, action to make them consistent and more transparent. And that, that's something which I think um, has come onto the table quite recently, probably largely as a result of racing's pressure and yeah, of the absolutely. pressure from customers. And that, that raises the prospect, hopefully, of something tangible happening in the short term. Yeah, and if, if, you, if you look at this in terms of principles, one principle is the government has said that it doesn't want um, the higher level of checks to come in unless the system can be frictionless. So that's a line in the sand it, it, mm. it's created itself. We know that at the moment already, checks are carrying out at a, at a high level with punters, with ratings customers being asked to provide financial details. If the government has said, as it has, that it wants to look to um, create a system, an ongoing system that has more, uh, has more consistency, if it has already said that it doesn't believe checks should be carried out until they're frictionless, and mm. they're not at the moment, you would hope the government might say, okay, well, for the moment, we are going to speak to Gambling Commission and ask the Gambling Commission to instruct bookmakers not to carry out these checks as they stand at the moment, pending the outcome of our efforts to create a frictionless system. That, in theory, is what should happen based on the principles the government has already laid down. Governments don't often work, though, to principles. So, Maddie. We hope we're going to see some action in 2024, both in the interim checks, but also on the shape of the eventual checks. However, there's a lot of concern nonetheless about the impact this has already had on racing finances and yep. the impact it will have in the future. The figure that was quoted uh, recently was, was 250 million over five years. Uh, just give you a view on what sort of impact that's going to have on racing if racing sees a decline in its in its income from betting. Well, yeah, it's absolutely huge. Um, goes without saying. And I think the two things, um, the two points that we've mentioned that we're going to find out about um, the consultation and also the debate in the new year. For me, the the only thing to add is we're still waiting, and this is further uncertainty and ambiguity surrounding this whole issue at a time when we already know that our customers you know people who read the racing post are experiencing these checks that aren't frictionless you know that are asking for um, extensive financial personal data and therefore you know going to the black market so the mm. longer this uncertainty continues and we're left without the clarity which as you've said lee in the meantime might not even necessarily be addressed as as it should be in theory um the more dangerous the situation gets so that would be my concern but undoubtedly you know we've read the statistics out on this show before and ultimately betting is such a huge part of racing's funding model in the uk that if people are you know significantly cutting down on their gambling interest then that's going to have a humongous uh, knock-on effect 
Yeah, and we'll come to the impact of that on things like Premier Racing later in the show. And we're going to move on to our second story, and it's over to Ireland, where they're having their own issues around the impact of regulation. Uh, David, tell us a little bit for viewers who might not be as familiar with the gambling regulation bill as you are, what it means for Irish racing. Yeah, I suppose not a lot has probably happened, although it's probably happening behind the scenes in the last kind of couple of weeks or months. But at the moment, uh, what's being proposed in the gambling regulation bill is uh, it's basically preventing gambling advertising between the hours of 5.30 a.m. in the morning at 9 o'clock at night. So Racing TV, Basta Racing TV, Sky Sports Racing have come out and said, if this happens, if we can ha not have gambling advertising between these crucial hours, uh, it will be econom economically unviable, which obviously makes perfect sense. So it's at a stage now, it's at the, it's at the report stage in the doll since July 12th. So July 12th is quite a while ago. So that would suggest to me that they are trying to work at least behind the scenes on amendments that HRI are doing all the lobbying they can to try and ensure this gambling ban doesn't happen in its current form, the gambling advertising ban. Um, <coughs> and the fact that July 12th, we're now obviously after Christmas, the fact that July 12th was the middle of summer and we're still at the same stage is probably a good thing, Tom, I'd imagine. I'd imagine that it's that it's stalled in this area suggests that certain amendments are being made and there are other amendments which need to be made as well because it's not just the actual gambling advertising between those specific hours there's also a case of you know if if bookmakers are sponsoring races and they have signs on fences is stuff like that not going to be allowed and those different little amendments the big one obviously is the gambling advertising bill which looks like it's going to come in at this stage even though you know as I said, it has stalled. It's going to be very hard for them to take that away at this stage, I think. But if we can make the other little amendments, it will obviously help. And then the next stage at this stage, Tom, is what's going to happen if this gambling advertising bill does come in between the, those hours? Who is going to fund uh, the money that's left behind? Because I spoke to Suzanne Eid, the chief executive of Horse Racing Ireland, about this on numerous occasions. And I said, oh, what happens here? What happens if you cannot watch Irish racing in Ireland? And she couldn't answer the question because she just kept reiterating the fact that that will not happen. Irish people, Irish owners, Irish racing fans will be able to watch Irish racing in Ireland and that we will make sure that happens by hook or by crook. So that that's that's her stance on it. So then you're kind of thinking to yourself, OK, so what's actually going to happen then if this does happen? So are HRI going to fund the money that would have been funded by gambling advertising? But then they're kind of putting back in the money they're getting for... The, the media rights so you're kind of going well that doesn't really make sense so I have no idea where this where they're going to find stuff to fill this hole if this gambling bill does come into force and time wise that's I suppose what what a lot of viewers at the front page will be wondering they'll be kind of saying to themselves well well if it this does come in and racing tv potentially and sky sports racing is going to come off air in Ireland when is it going to come in and at this stage you're thinking probably it'll be 2025 it will probably take a year and you'd imagine hopefully in that year we've 12 months now to try and find some sort of a solution to a problem that could potentially blow up the whole industry and hmm. that might sound like hyperbole but but it's not tom are there going to be recriminations from this as well because this is a a, a bill which has been in gestation for some time now uh, the argument, I suppose, is that those who are in positions of power in Irish racing should have seen it coming and should have been taking more determined, forceful action to influence it. It's very striking, I think, that you know, we're, we're, you're, you're dealing with a proposal in Ireland which, even when it was discussed in Britain, was always caveated with, of course, there would be a carve-out for horse racing. Even anti-gamblers, anti-gambling campaigners acknowledge that there ought to be a carve-out for racing. So it's kind of extraordinary that Irish racing has allowed this situation to develop where basically they're, they're potentially being put in a position whereby the funding for the televised coverage of Irish racing is severely jeopardised and possibly is going to have to be made up through diminished prize money. Yeah, extraordinary is the right word, Tom, and you hit the nail on the head there. You're trying to, to put it in horse racing terms, I suppose, you're trying to come with this absolute massive late rattle in the last 100 yards of a derby and you're, you know, 40 lengths behind 
you know, coming down from, from Tottenham Corner. And you're going, why were you in that position in the first place? Why are we not closer to the pace? Why did you not have your eyes on the prize and have the eyes on the main danger earlier in the race rather than, you know, inside the final 100 yards when some would say it's a lost cause? Now, we all know the odd lost cause does actually end up winning, but it looks like it's probably gone beyond recall at this stage. And I, I would completely agree with you. It seems to me like something that should have been nipped in the bud very early on. With this gambling regulation bill, it should have been a case of, you know, we agree with all these points and there was such a need for regulation in Ireland on gambling. And everybody acknowledges that from, from all quarters. But this should have been ring fence from the racing channels. We should have been sorting out our industry from a very, very early stage. And it looks like it's just happened not just a bit too late, but a lot too late. And we've serious ground to make up now. And as I said, the last 100 yards, which is probably the next couple of weeks, is going to be absolutely crucial. And fingers crossed it won't come to Irish racing not being on, on Irish television because it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever that, that you could watch a race from Leopardstown in London, but you can't watch it in Dublin. It's, it's bonkers. Thanks very much, DJ. And that is a wrap on regulation. We're going to move on now to one of the stories which defined the year. Uh, you could barely get away from it at any point. It's not a 40 base checks, it's Frankie de Tori, who was ubiquitous in the year that was his retirement and then wasn't his retirement. Um, he's now moved to America. He's going to be riding in Santa Anita. He says he has had his last rides in Britain. He had a farewell, glitzy farewell party. Um, will he be back, Maddie? Of course he will. I definitely think he will. Uh, I find it hard to believe Royal Ascot rolls around. He's still actively riding and he's going to say, no, I don't want to turn up. Um, yeah. I think he's definitely going to be there. Um, we know what a big, a big name he is and how incredible he's been for the sport over the years. But I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, phase of the, the Frankie de Tori mania of where well, you've said goodbye. And now, in an essence, you've sort of betrayed people by not intentionally lying, but you're not telling the truth because you're coming back. Um, racing has relied on Frankie's charisma and his showmanship, I think, for so long. There's often this huge question of, oh, what happens next when he's no longer here? And I've come to think about it and I almost think it's overplayed slightly. You know, a lot of sports don't necessarily have one standout persona. They might have one standout champion, but they don't necessarily have to have a certain character within that. And you can sell the personalities of your sports people without them fitting into one exact mold. You know, you look at Holly Doyle and Tom Marquand, they're fantastic ambassadors for racing. They're incredibly likable. Mm. They're great at selling the sport. Just because they're not Frankie de Tori doesn't mean that racing's gonna crash and burn without him. Um, and, you know, talk of who is going to be the next Frankie de Tori. I think there's only ever going to be one of them. Um, but there are people who some people might not realise. When, when I was in Hong Kong earlier in, in the year for the international races, there was Zach Purton there and he came into a press conference with a cap that said the king on it. Hmm. And we were sort of saying, what's all that about, Zach? And he said, I've just got to remind everyone who I am. Uh, and, you know, he's the sort of jockey who has custom made jewellery saying ZP on it and he oh. wears big chains around his neck and he really embraces that showman side of things. And a lot of people might not even necessarily be aware of that. So I think we've just got to appreciate who we've got in racing rather than obsess over the need for this very specific character to, to take us forward. And maybe racing's almost been relying on Frankie too much for too long. You know, we need to innovate, we need mm. to sell our stories, and they're not all going to be the same as his. I think that's a really fair point Maddie makes. You know, there, there is only one Frankie de Tori, and if you're asking who's the next Frankie de Tori, then it's almost a wrong question. But I suppose if we think about who are the future stars of the sport, and we do want people to have interesting characters, maybe a, a, a bit of showmanship, you know, they just need to forge a connection with the public, I guess, is the main thing. And that's what Frankie did so well. Who can forget a Royal Ascot, uh, people chanting his names almost like a football match. It was sensational scenes. Um, what, who is on the conveyor belt of talent? Who's, who has that potential to forge that link with the public beyond the racing public? Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult task to set anybody. I think in part because, you know, once upon a time, um, back in the 1970s, for example, racing was a much bigger deal in mm. society. 
and everybody had heard of Lester Piggott, Willie Carson, Pat Edry. They were household names. As society has changed, as television has changed, as sport has changed, racing's place has changed, which means it's harder for individuals to break through, particularly individuals who, when they're doing their job, they're not recognisable. You know, they're wearing colours, they're wearing masks, people, uh, goggles, people don't know who they are. So it is hard. There is hope though, I'd say hope on two fronts. Um, you will find characters in a sport. Um, Alan Johns, um, jump jockey, he produced a video for the Welsh Jump Jockeys Derby, a charity race uh, to support Christine Williams' uh, daughter and the family. Uh, and that was incredibly humorous and he has character. Um, and that sort of person could well get an avenue in 2024 through the new six part docuseries that mm. will be airing on ITV main, ITV's main channel in prime time on midweek evenings. And that has a real opportunity uh, if they find the right people uh, and give those people a platform to be themselves, that has the opportunity, not just to sell racing, but to sell racing characters, because we all know horses don't talk. Tomo interviewed Lowe's and he couldn't manage it. Um, <laughs> horses don't talk, people do. And if they can find the right people in that docuseries, then racing does have a chance to connect with uh, non-racing fans in a way that racing itself will always struggle to achieve. I think as well. Do we, do we want characters anymore, though? This is the thing that I would say, like, uh, I remember doing a column on this a couple of years ago about no, nobody wants to be another Frankie. Nobody wants to be the character anymore. It's like, um, it's a mentality thing, I think. And you see it across all different sports as well. Like, like, is there another Gaza? Like, there's no Gazas. There's no... Um, there's no real, you know, the likes of uh, uh, Jimmy Bullard or, or somebody like that. Like, there's no real people in, in the last decade that are actually trying to be a Gaza. or try Because the mentality, I think, has completely changed in sport. It's like, if you're a top rider, like a Paul Townend or a Jack Kennedy, your job is to ride the horse. And the less you're in newspapers for your, your character and your flamboyancy, the better with your boss, who's your trainer. So they want to see less of you outside of the saddle and more of you doing your stuff in the saddle and it's the same with footballers now like can you name a single premier league footballer where you go oh my god You're like he's absolutely hilarious like he's he's a character oh my god i'd love well, to like I, I go for it, it's, they're not footballers it's the managers dj in the premier league this is what i was going to say we're putting this great pressure on um finding another jockey but do they necessarily need to be a jockey? Yes, I can see why that would be ideal. But look at someone like Ruby Walsh or Ted Walsh, for instance, who mm. is known for being a huge character. Ruby is massively popular now on, on ITV. And although he might not be as, you know, outwardly charismatic and, or showmanly as, say, Frankie Dottori was, his humour is different and people appreciate him for that humour and, and that sly little, well, yeah. sly little laugh or, you know, little dig or... People like that, and I think that's just as just as endearing and just as good as as someone in the mould of Frankie. Yeah, yeah, and, and and DJ, anyone in Ireland who you know is that you know the next Ruby or Ted or Johnny Murta, you've had plenty of characters over the year over there. Uh, who's who who's your favourite interviewee, for example? Yeah, we have, and and I suppose. Uh until recently we had Davy Russell who uh, was quite controversial and always kind of provoked debate in, in many other areas and he's obviously retired now there's one guy now not for not for kind of colorfulness or, or character but there's one guy I am utterly convinced will make it in every sense of the world and he's actually riding in Australia at the moment it's Dylan Brown McMonagall and mm. um, he's this kind of young guy that rode for Joseph and will be riding for Joseph as well but he's just got it he's a terrific rider his, it's like as if he's had media training since he was in nappies because everything just rolls off the tongue with him. It's like you ask him a question and sometimes you ask jockeys a question and you're like, oh God, I knew that was going to be the answer. And you're like, why do I even bother? With this guy, he thinks and he's able to get from his brain to his mouth really quickly and he gives you really, really smart answers like and really, really good. And uh, I remember I did a piece with him actually and... Uh, Aoife was with me at the races and she goes, oh my God, who's that guy? He's gorgeous. So apparently women love him as well. <laughs> so if uh, if uh, Dylan Brown McMonagall uh, doesn't make it, it would be my fault for jinxing him because I think not only has he got the ability in the saddle, 
he can talk a really good game and uh, it's great when you when you see somebody like him that just seems to have it all uh, I think the future is very bright for Dylan Brown McMonagall if they don't steal him down under from us let's hope not thanks very much um, we're going to be back in just a minute if you're looking for a late Christmas present for yourself or a loved one uh, why not get yourself a subscription to Members Club Ultimate have a look at some of the features here Members Club is now available on the Racing Post app. All Members Club subscribers can now access premium news and tips anytime, anywhere. Plus, if you're not already a member, you'll get 50% off your first three months. If you haven't already subscribed yet and want to join the greatest club in racing, simply visit racingpost.com forward slash subscribe. Welcome back. Uh, next on our agenda, we're going to talk about the launch of Premier Racing just a few days away. This is the brave new dawn for British horse racing. The initiative that's been dreamt up at, that is going to uh, usher us into the future of racing, bring in new fans, solve the problems uh, that we have around funding, or well, at least that's the idea. Um, it took quite a long time for them to even agree a logo. The marketing budget stands at zero pounds. And it seems that some people in the sport already think it's a bad idea. Uh, Lee, fair to say, um, you know, as sporting event launches go, yeah. there's been better. Yes. Um, I'm not expecting to go to Cheltenham on New Year's Day and to be blown away by the premier concept Mm -hmm. of that first Premier meeting. Um, I think a lot of what they have done is laudable in the sense they have created a way that they believe they can showcase, highlight British Racing's Premier fixtures. Um, they have found a way of getting more money into those top end meetings, although to an extent that money's coming from the bottom end of the sport. Um, they have done work with the, the Sunday programme, which was, which was necessary and helpful, and some Sundays will be better than they were in the past. But the problem with, I think, what they have done, um, aside from a strong belief that it should boost betting turnover, and it ought to, because not least because of the, the, the protected window on Saturdays and the spread of action across a Saturday, that will help betting turnover. But what they haven't really done is thought who any of this is aimed at. Mm. Um, I did a piece uh, early in December in which um, I spoke with Jed Shields, a prominent racehorse owner who has had a career in marketing. And he explained that when you're trying to sell something to somebody, you first of all have to think, what does that somebody want? And who is that somebody? And racing hasn't really done that with this project. It hasn't decided. Who in the population do we believe Premier Race Days could um, attract? That, I think, is, is, a, is a major flaw. Um, I think it's, it, it's incredibly disappointing that the sport will go into this with no more money to spend on promoting them. Mm. Um, Rod Street, Great British Racing, has uh, nine full-time staff, a budget of around £1.6 million. None of that will change, this, unless they can get some more money out the levy board early in 2024. I loved the bit in your article where you said there are more chief executives yeah. on the sports commercial committee than there are marketing staff at GBR. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? This is a sport full of people with clipboards saying what we should or shouldn't do, yeah. and virtually no one actually picking up a shovel and getting things done. Yeah, and you, you can imagine scenes of commercial committee meetings where Rod Street has been making the case that we need to find money to actually sell this to people. And people simply just, just haven't listened. Mm. Now, some people, of course, don't want to listen because um, we know that there are, there are race courses that believe this is the best strategy and that it actually makes more sense to see if these, the new structure does increase betting turnover. And if it does, then we'll spend money on marketing it. But there are also people who don't believe it's gonna make much difference anyway, who take the view that if you actually look at the race program, Nothing really has changed. Classic chase day at Warwick is still going to be classic chase day at Warwick. And therefore, why spend tons of money marketing something that we don't think will connect with, with people anyway? So I think that is a concern too. And one of the things I heard when I was speaking to people, which was probably the most depressing, was a view that at the very worst, um, this could all fizzle out as another damp squib that really in two or three years' time, people don't remember. Now, that's a view that 
some ways wasn't wasn't meant from a bad place because it's from people that don't necessarily believe it's going to work anyway. But you just sense that if racing really had believed in this and really did think it was a golden ticket for the sport in the future, they have had to do more with it than they have. Mm. Maddie, we should remember why this came about. It came about because uh, racing was suffering major problems with small field sizes, declining attendances, uh, sort of weakness in betting interest on the sport. I mean, racing has problems that need to be addressed. And um, if this not, isn't the answer, and it maybe isn't, what is? I have a lot of respect for what they've tried to do. And there is obviously evidence that this is, is going to pay off, certainly in terms of, as Lee's mentioned, the betting window and increasing turnover, etc. And I do feel for the BHA and racing's leaders because on one hand they have their hands tied behind their back because they have so little control over the mm. fixture list. But at the same time, not only do I not think the promotion's been particularly good, also I just don't really buy into the whole concept of if you're trying to attract new fans, a new fan isn't going to go, oh, I'm going to go racing on Saturday because there's now a better race or, oh, because there's a few, fewer races here and more races here. That's not what attracts a new person to the industry anyway. Um, and I think ultimately this manipulation of, of fixtures is all well and good, but ultimately we need wholesale change. You know, I, I'm all for embracing change and innovation and, you know, credit where it's due for, for trying at least and trying to put a plan into action. But I, I really have concerns whether this is going to be effective. I, I don't think the, the, the vibes have been particularly encouraging on this front from the parties that I've spoken to. Mm. I think what is key as well, Tom, is that when people go racing to a Premier Race Day, it will have to feel different to the same race day when the previous year. I don't think it will. No, well, certainly not without any budget no. in order to promote it and make it feel different. Make it feel, you know, that, there's a lot to be said, I think, for... Um, creating a look and feel that, that yes. you know yeah. the champions league in football of yeah. course you know the famous music you know really sort of sets the tone the logo it all comes together underpinned by a quality product mm -hmm. but you know i don't think anyone necessarily says racing's product isn't quality perhaps at times when it needs work done mm. on it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, maybe I'm going the wrong way. There. I raised my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> I lost confidence. Um, DJ, if you were going to start a, start again in racing, is that too much? I don't know, get a blank sheet of paper. What would you change? Oh, God. That is a question I wasn't expecting to be asked. Uh, what would I change? Um, I would certainly make it more affordable for starters. Uh, I would. Uh, I did a. I did a column recently, a kind of a, a five point plan on where I thought racing was going wrong, and and that was more for the racing experience rather than people at home. And and I do think there are there are kind of big issues which need to be sorted on racetracks to get people to stop falling attendances. Like like thirty five minute gaps gone. Get rid of them. We need to figure out a way to get racing races closer together i i suggested 20 minutes and and that was probably too, a bit too extreme but imagine if you had you know seven races packed into the to the best part of two hours and it was bang 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 it was excitement you're going from one to the next it was just i think that would be uh more exciting for the race goer who let's be honest about it i because i go racing so much you see the boredom on racetracks you see people i was at a race meeting in avon where the first four races were sprints they lasted a minute each and people were utterly bored for the other 34 minutes because there's nothing to do uh, so that would be the one thing i'd close i'd certainly i'd close the gaps i would make the experience better when you go racing and that's a key thing for me i think when you're sitting at home you have access to racing tv or itv or or sky sports racing and you have a phenomenal service in front of you you're warm you're on your couch you need to figure out a way to make the experience better when people go right goes to the race and i for the life of me cannot understand why if not over the main tannoy in the main parade ring at a race course why there is not a specific area near the main hub so near the parade ring where you have a presenter you have a pundit you have a, a you know a, a proper punter maybe you have a a, a a paddock expert where you have a panel of people where people at the races can go 
to listen to to try and find the solutions to the races. Why we have this brilliant product at home, but yet if you go to the races, you get an odd maybe an odd interview here and there. And in fairness, the likes of Cheltenham do very well with Martin Kelly and stuff. But I don't think we're providing enough for the race goer and visually as well. I, I suggest it's okay at the big meetings. Um, you have you have big screens at Cheltenham, but you go to a lot of meetings these days. If you don't have binoculars with you, you can't see a jot. So I would suggest more big screens closer gaps between the races and improving the product itself when you get to the races and actually giving race goers information. So in a nutshell, Tom, there would be a couple of uh, little ideas that I'd have. Love it. Excellent. And that column got a massive mailbag as well. Um, people really, really uh, resonated or hated some of the suggestions, to be fair. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You'll get people complaining <laughs> that 20 minutes, that's no time to grab a beer, but that's yeah, another yeah. point in itself. Make, what would the, you, what would you change? make them better staff. What would you change? If you had one, one thing you could change, oh. what would it be? The fixture list. Let's sort <laughs> out the fixture list. Yeah. Um, let's have data-driven analysis of what we need to do you know, to serve the horse population, have competitive races that people want to bet on, compelling races. Just sort it out. Start again. <laughs> love it, love it. How about you, Lee? Um, I'd link to one of the PC's points that DJ made um, about bringing the broadcast experience to the race course. If you go racing um, in, in Oz, the race goers are shown on the big screen the if you're in Melbourne, the racing.com program being played out all the time. So you don't feel if you're on the race course that people sat at home other end of the country are hearing, discovering, learning things that you're not learning. Now it's easier over there because they might only have one or two meetings to broadcast at any one time. But it just means that you haven't necessarily got that boredom angle that DJ is talking about. Because if you're on the race course, you might be in a bar, on the steppings, in a seat, and you're actually, you actually can watch Say, for example, Ruby Walsh analysing a race after it's taken place. You're not just sat there twiddling your thumb. So I'd find a way, and it can't be that difficult, of bringing the TV coverage onto the race course. I, one final thing, I'm a big advocate for sitting down. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm incredibly lazy. Yeah. And when it's cold and rainy and miserable in the winter, and I've had enough because I've backed four losers in a row, sometimes I just want somewhere to have a hot drink and a sit down in the warm. And you'd be surprised at how difficult a lot of race courses that is to get. Food oh. as well. Um, and I talk about food a lot. Soup. S soup. Yeah. Soup. I'm not saying it's racing's golden ticket or the answer to all <laughs> racing's problems, but you go racing to, to a lot of jumps meeting in, in the winter and you're going to pay a fortune for rubbish mm. food. If they had soup stations, you might pay seven or eight quid, have three or four choices of soup, nourishing, get you through the afternoon, soup. Well, there we go. Mm. The five point plan to fix racing, which ends with the one word, soup. Um, there's lots of great racing over the Christmas period. If I could change one thing, I would introduce a Christmas festival in Britain. I think it's an absolute no-brainer. It would just require people to work together, so it probably will never happen. But in the meantime, we can at least enjoy an absolute feast of top-class racing over the next few days. And if you're looking to get some free bets, we've got a page which is absolutely jam-packed with essential information. Check out this advert. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're going to now move on to another story which seems quite old but at this point because it happened early in the year and then slightly fizzled out. And this was the efforts by animal rights protesters to derail some of the big early season highlights. They invaded the track at the Grand National for which uh, a number of them were arrested. And then they promised to disrupt uh, the derby but thanks to a extensive um, operation, security operation, cooperation with the police and a uh, court injunction, uh, the protest proved to be a bit of a damp squib. However, um, it reinforced that the entire welfare debate is not going away. In fact, if anything, it is becoming something which becomes more and more important with each passing year. I think in unconnected events, the Jockey Club took some action to make some changes to the Grand National, re most notably reducing uh, the field size, 
Uh, obviously a controversial decision, but not as controversial as it might have been a few years ago, and it was very striking to see most people in racing uh, giving their support to the jockey club. Maddie, just how big of a concern is it for racing that there might be a repeat of the animal rising protests next year? It's an obvious concern because we saw how it disrupted the race um, this year and also other racing events. You know, we had the whole debacle at Epsom. Um, I wonder if, if, you know, police custody is, is going to be a turn off for some protesters and, you know, the real threat of, of the consequences of their actions on that respect. But as much as Animal Rising, perhaps the spotlight's gone down on them. And I think I mentioned this on a, on a show previously. We've learned some key lessons from this not only is there a, a new way of thinking about horse racing that i'm not saying we need to pander to it but we need to acknowledge that it's there and where possible you know make arrangements for it but also that just because maybe one of the groups animal rising has you know for now not been cited in an awfully long time mm. i think number one they will probably be back at the grand national because they know that that's the big horse racing's big event and they know that that's going the time of year when a lot of people are going to be tuning in for the first time and expressing their views on on racing which in a way shows you that you know only one time of year is when they they come out and they care about the sport so that's one thing and um, but also there's going to be new groups i think this is a, a modern society we're talking about now people rightly are allowed to have their own views on on things um but I would say just because Animal Rising didn't necessarily work out in their own interests isn't to say another group's going to. So I think it's still a threat that we need to take incredibly seriously. And that line between balancing the essence of racing and protecting it and also modernising and making it an acceptable spectacle for a newer audience and a newer world, if we're being honest, is something that we're going to have to grapple with. What do you think about the changes to the Grand National, Maddie? They were probably inevitable, um, but I do see an element of concern in that there is always going to be an element of risk. And if it's a Grand National with no deaths that you want, you will probably be changing and changing and changing and you're never going to get it right. Uh, there's always going to be an element of risk. You think, how many Grand Nationals did we have without a single fatality? We had quite a good run a few years ago. Yeah. How much of that is just down to, to chance and to fortune and percentages? Um, and ultimately, I don't think you, you can ever have jump racing without any risk of, of that awful thing happening that we all hate to see. And there is an element of acceptance sounds very harsh, but ultimately it's true, you know, in, in life there is death in the same way that there is with humans and there is risk implicit in almost everything we do. And as I say, it's about that balance between the past and what racing is about and what racing should be about, but also acknowledging that, you know, it's no longer the 1950s and we have to adapt and some of those decisions are honourable and I can understand why they've been made and I think they deserve to be applauded but it's an uncomfortable situation I think ultimately and as I say if, it, if it's a, a perfect sport in terms of visually and uh, fatality statistics that you're after you're not going to get it. DJ I often sense that the uh, quite a sharp cultural difference between Britain and Ireland on this um, do you, from your perspective, do you think Britain is just simply trying to appease the unappeasable um, or do you see some yes. method in what, it, what the sport is doing? I, I, I would certainly agree with your first point that they're never going to be happy ever. So the amount of changes we make, do you think if there's no fatalities in the next 10 years in the Grand National, they're just going to go away? No, they're not. They're just going to keep nagging away for as long as they can. And I, I can certainly see why the changes have been made. And you can understand them and you can understand they're coming from a good place. And, and that's the thing, like they are coming from a good place because you're, you're trying to get the solution where we have no fatalities in the Grand National. I think but also, Mandy, DJ, you're trying to preserve the race. You know, if the race still existed in the guise that it was in the, you know, 50s and 60s, then it wouldn't it wouldn't be here. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And, and you made a very valid point there. You, a lot of it is luck. Like a lot of it is 
you know, a horse could just for some reason get unlucky, could take a false step, could, you know, just make a wrong shape at a fence and could, you know, you know, bang into another horse or something. So that, that could happen. But the one point I would make is how, you know, when these changes were being made by the BHA, like and reducing the field to 34, how they didn't have the foresight to realise, oh, oh, hold on a second, if we do that, maybe maybe the fairy tales could be ruined. Maybe Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott could have seven runners in the race each. And maybe we're actually, you know, we're, we're pricing so many people out in the market now that, oh God, this could actually, oh, hold on a second. So, you know, what we'll do actually in a few weeks time, we're going to, or in a few months time, we're actually going to get it out there and say, oh, um, we're going to restrict, you know, trainers to four runners in a race. Like, like, this should have been discussed before these grand national changes were made. Like when, when the news emerged that the field was going to be reduced to 34, my instinct reaction straight away was, okay, it's going to become a classier race because trainers are not going to be afraid to run the better caliber of horse in it because there's a smaller field and luck has been taken out of it. And that means that Gordon Elliott, Willie Mullins, Henry de Bromhead, like they're they're going to have multiple runners in the race because they have the top rated horses. So basically, you're you're scrapping the fairy tales here. And and Gordon Elliott, Willie Mullins, uh, Henry de Brahma, whoever, they're just going to absolutely dominate the race in the next ten or, or fifteen or twenty years. And I just don't see how that won't happen. Last word on this, Lee. Do you fear for the future of the Grand National? Uh, yes, I think inevitably I do. And it's it's the race I love more than than any other. Um, I adore it, but I do fear for it. I don't go along with the um, trying to appease the unappeasable line. I, 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 I think that's too easy to say that. I think, I think what the, the sport has been trying to do is to work with that middle ground constituency of people because you're never going to... It's, it's right, they are unappeasable. And I don't think the sport is trying to appease those people. I think it's trying to get those people who on Grand National Night might have been listening to five live in the evening and hearing constant debates and phones about is the Grand National cruel. I think they're the sort of people that the sport is trying to uh, work with. But I do fear for the race. Um, the, the Grand National is a, is, a, is a strange thing in that those who love it say that the jeopardy of the Grand National is what sells a race to the masses. Mm -hmm. Those who worry for it say the jeopardy of the race is what puts people off. I can see why they brought the field down Both to third, up there, and they yeah. bar, and that's the problem. Both are absolutely true. Yeah. I can see why they brought the field down to thirty-four. Um, the danger is, as 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 we've said before, there will be more fatalities in the Grand National, and in what they've done now, they've brought the field down to a point at which they say they don't want to bring it down any further because that will make the horses go faster, a smaller field. They've brought the first fence as forward as it can do. So the problem is, if there is a future fatality, where is the wiggle room? You know, what more can you do with the Grand National? If you have a horrible year and two or three horses die, where do you go next? They run yeah. the American Grand National over hurdles. Be careful. Yeah. Be careful. The, the, yeah. One, the one final thing I'd say is, and DJ probably won't like this, and I'm not necessarily saying I like it, but I think it reflects well on racing that they've made these changes. You know, these aren't the first changes they've made to the race. They're continually adapting and, you know, changing mm. fence heights and, and things like that. And I think that reflects very well because it shows that this is something that we care about and we give consideration to and we're not afraid to adapt. And there is a line for all of us where we think right and wrong lies and we, we do want to strive for better. So I think that's that reflects well and people can acknowledge that we're trying to we're trying when to make things better. When do we start better. to have confidence in our product, Maddie? When can we have supreme confidence in what we're doing is right? I suppose the argument is, is it, is, you know, what, then is it going to be a point at which you basically say, well, all the changes we ever want to make is, have been done and what we have today is what is going to remain forevermore. That, that seems improbable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's not a hope of that happening. But I, I just think at some stage and, you know, you have to just say to yourself, look, we're, we're comfortable. We're comfortable that we're doing what we can for the future of the sport. And we're comfortable that the Grand National is a, a unique event that, that, you know, is the world's most famous horse race. And you have to have confidence at some stage in your best product and no, the Grand National is our best product and you have to you know we're we're running the sport and if 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 we can't have confidence 
in our best product. I just I just fear for the future. Like it's we, at some stage we just need to go right enough is enough. This is what we have, like at our lump. But also, well, DJ, the amount on, of I'm, racing I'm, fans that weren't happy with the spectacle, I I think that stands out as well. And you have to listen to the people who are actually watching the race as well. I think uh, we could go on <laughs> on this topic for a long time. Um, but as DJ says, enough is enough. We are going to go on to our last talking point, and this is looking back at the superstars of 2023, and, and indeed ahead, of course, because this is a preview show rather than a review show, about who are going to be the equine talents we're all talking about in 2024. Uh, well, two of the big stars of the 23 season, Ace Impact and Equinox, have headed off to the breeding barns. Uh, some of the uh, other stars that are just emerging and who are going to be uh, taking our focus next year are Maddy. The first one that came to my mind was Inspiral. So okay. dazzling in the Breeders' Cup. John Gosden said afterwards, well, she's just proved that we've been running her over the wrong trip all this time, over 10 furlongs, of course. Um, I'm really excited to see her in training for another season, particularly if the boundaries of what she can achieve are broadened, specifically regarding trip, but also it'd be great to see her, we've seen her against the boys many times before, of course, but it would be great to see her in races like the Judmont International. And who knows, she's by Frankel. If she stays a mile and a quarter, well, maybe she'll try a mile and a half. I just think she is one that came to mind straight away for me. Love her turn of foot. Of course, her association with Frankie de Tori has been one of the talking mm. points of this year. Will he be back on her back? Um, I can't wait to see her. Lee? Uh, I think over jumps, you'd expect more from, from Constitution Hill, who didn't make any sort of impact in our favourite racehorse poll. So it'd be interesting if, as with another season, he does connect with the wider sport of sporting public more. And I think the fascinating horse on the flat is clearly City of Troy. In that I, we become a bit um, almost immune to hype when it comes to cool more horses because they do often get hyped up because Aidan O'Brien is a really enthusiastic trainer and he, and he gets very excited about his horses and it's a great thing to see. And um, he's creating stud careers. And he's creating stud careers. <laughs> but I do sense that they really believe that he could be something a bit different. Um, and I hope he is, because if there's one really good narrative that we could have through the flat season of 2024, it would be if we did have a horse who won the Guineas and then the Derby and then marched on towards a potential Triple Crown challenge at Doncaster. I think maybe he could be the one. And if he is, let's hope he isn't retired at the end of his three-year-old career, because Ace Impact made no impact whatsoever on the wider sporting public. No. <laughs> And DJ, finally yourself, who are the stars you are looking forward to seeing next year? Yeah, sure. As as Lee said, their city of Troy is obviously the, the real sexy one. Um I, I just would would suggest don't forget Henry Longfellow, because City of Troy is there and he's the one that they're properly talking up and he's going to be the potential triple crown horse. Like you forget that that Henry Longfellow is unbeaten national stakes winner who's rated 119 and in any other normal season would be the champion two year old, but he's just around the same time as City of Troy. So I think Henry Longfellow is very, very good, but uh, he's a bit like, you know, I suppose um I don't know, Ronaldo's brother or something. It's going to be very hard for him because he's around the same time as, as as City of Troy. I'm going to give you a mad one, OK? I think I potentially might have found a horse that could win the 2024 Ascot Gold Cup, but he's not even in the betting yet. Uh, it's a horse called Lion's Pride, who's trained by uh, John and Thady Godston. He's a half-brother to Courage, one of me, who won the race last year. Um, I think this horse is very good. I've written about him twice, and... Uh, he has flopped twice on grass, but there have been perfectly legitimate excuses for that. thought he was really good at Kempton and Lister race in November. Um, he's a rate 107 now. I think next season, when he gets proper racing into him over extreme distances, I think he could come into his own. And we, we'll ask for a price. We might get 66s or 50s. I think he could be an outsider for the Ascot Gold Cup. But that is Lions Pride, who's owned by Anthony Oppenheimer. Well, you heard it here first, uh, Lions Pride for the 2024 Ascot Gold Cup. Um, well, obviously, there'll be a ton of equine stars at the Cheltenham Festival. Um, we are running a competition to give away tickets for the festival. So uh, watch this for details on how to enter.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're almost at the end. We're almost at the end of the year, almost at the end of the show. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. To finish up, we wanted to do a rapid fire look back at 2023 to highlight our best moments, uh, horses, stars, rides, etc. So uh, without further ado, let's get cracking. Race of the year, Maddie Poyle. It's that thing where people always go, I was there when so-and-so won. And you think, it, the horse didn't care that you were there. That doesn't matter. Why is that part of your analysis? But I'm going for it. Um, the Shima Classic. It's a form line we've spoken about all year. It was won by the best horse in the world in Equinox. It was magnificent. Uh, Huckham and Westover in the King George, their duel up the straight at Ascot. DJ? One flat, one jumps. Uh, flat, champion stakes, king of steel, Frankie for... Uh, any reason you want and jumps recently Labrooks champion chase Jerry Kalam just an extraordinary performance from a horse who could be extraordinary next ride of the year a pivotal moment in the summer Frankie Dettori winning the Ebor aboard absurd horse got upset beforehand terrible draw didn't matter it's that man again Frankie Dettori trawler man in the British Champions long distance mm. cup he followed what looked like a crazy pacemaker but when the pacemaker folded he went on he allowed Ryan Moore to pass him at the top of the straight, knowing that it was too soon to ask his man to go for maximum effort, and he got back up towards the end. So I say Trollman, Frankie, Ascot. Is it a treble for a Frankie, DJ? No, this is absolutely ridiculous. The best <laughs> ride we've ever seen in our <laughs> lifetime happened in 2023, and uh, Maddie and Lee have just forgotten about it. Uh, I thought it was better than Witch the Line Man, and that was Paul Town and the Naya Maximus in the Irish Grand National. Yeah. Uh, it was, the horse never should have won. He never should have even been got into the race. And uh, he actually was a public vote at the Horse Racing Ireland Awards for, for Ride of the Year, and Amy Jo Hayes won it. Uh, I'd suggest that uh, that was probably wrong for all that it was a brilliant ride by Amy Jo, but Paul Town and that Naya Maximus, I would say, is probably the greatest ride I've seen in my lifetime. Horse of the Year. Uh, already said it, Equinox. Constitution Hill. And DJ? I'll go straight in. Flop of the year. This one was hard, and there's probably more that can be evidenced, but given what he did as a two year old, I thought Little Big Bear was pretty disappointing. Oh, I just, it still pains me. Vauban in the Melbourne Cup. Honestly, to be there in the build up to the race, that horse had already. Yeah. Well, he had already won the Melbourne Cup. <laughs> I read in one of the newspapers. Lloyd Williams, top owner, referencing that Kerry Packer, his great mate, the most feared punter in Australia, Australia's richest man, would have backed Vauban had he not been dead. There was a complete expectation that Vauban would win. He didn't. He's my best bet for 2024 back in the Melbourne Cup. <laughs> you hear DJ? Just, what was that noise? I think it was a, a scoff, a scoff chuckle. No, no, just uh, interesting. Yeah, Willie has probably tried to prove a point. Uh, my flop, flop of the year, unquestionably, is Chaldean. Oh, yeah. Good shout. Because everybody's probably going, who, who is Chaldean? <laughs> point proven. Point proven. Uh, race course of the year, Maddie. Has to be York. Their commitment to prize money, uh, the great racing they put on, everything about it, the experience. York do it best, I think. 2 0 for York. 2 0 for York. Another chance to bring up the treble, EJ? Ah, uh, there's nowhere like Cheltenham, Tom. Finally, uh, broadcaster of the year. Uh, I think it's got to be Nick Luck, hasn't it? He's been everywhere this year, um, but he seems to adapt so well, no matter where he is. Yeah, Nick's magnificent, but we have a lot of magnificent broadcasters over here, and therefore I'm going to not give it to any of them and say that I think Matt Hill, the caller in Melbourne, is the finest racing commentator in the world. God, you live in the UK, you know. But I, 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 I am a man of the world. Uh, a wild card, DJ? Uh, yeah, kind of. Like I'd agree with Nick's point, or Nick's point, with uh, Lee's <laughs> point about Nick and the rest of the... Like, we're, like you watch some of the, you know, the, the, the soccer, as we call it, the football coverage, or even different sports and you, you kind of say to yourself oh my god we're blessed in racing with with broadcasters that are out of this world nick is flawless as we all know and, and so many others are john hunt and that as well and uh, ed but 
I think Gary O'Brien for me, I was at the Horse Racing Ireland Awards last or a couple of weeks ago and uh, Gary was presenting with Nina Carvey and as a, a, a presenter sometimes myself, I do our Up in the Ante show, you kind of realise how hard it is at times for links and, and you know, if you get a tough interview and stuff like that. And I was in awe of Gary O'Brien that night. I just said, like, little different things did go wrong on the night with only tiny things that only I would notice. And he just was able to just bring it back. And he has this wit now. He's, you're get, getting to see his personality to go along with his flawless presenting. And for me, Gary has had another brilliant, brilliant year. And my dream is Gary O'Brien with Steve Mellish. And I'm happy out because I love Steve. OK, that's all we've got time for. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's show. But thank you also for joining us through 2023 on the front page and indeed all the suite of Racing Post TV shows. Uh, we will be back in 2024 with more news analysis and debate around all the big talking points. Please do join us for that. It just remains for me to say thank you very much to my panel, Lee Morrisett, Maddie Quayle and David Jennings. Thank you to you as well and a very happy new year.